Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in again. I have a question for you. What did you have for lunch today? Okay, I'm embarrassed to say I had two bites of last night's chicken and like four handfuls of kettle corn because I'm working constantly. <laughs> I don't have any time to eat, but that's a choice. If your answer was anything other than nothing, we don't have enough money right now for lunch for either of us or the kids, then you are way luckier than millions of Americans right now. I mean, you've heard the story or maybe you're living it. COVID-19 has taken lives, jobs, and left us all in a state of uncertainty. But hunger? With millions of Americans without a job and schools converting to online learning, having access to food has actually, in this country, in this modern first world country, become a luxury. But guess what? It would have been so much worse had it not been for this week's podcast guest who not only jumped into action, but is so powerful and persuasive that she managed to wrestle $100 million from Amazon's Jeff Bezos himself to help the cause. I'd like to welcome Feeding America CEO Claire babineau Fontano to Everyone Talks to Liz. Hi, Claire. Well, hi, Liz. I really like that intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, wait, 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 wait. $100 million from Jeff Bezos. How did that conversation get started? Wow. Uh, you know, I've, I've been asked that now a couple of times because it got some press. That's the largest gift in the history of our movement, in fact. And um, people have sometimes attributed that to me. Well, I was on the receiving end. And the way I put it is my job was to just not mess it up. <laughs> but apparently, um, Mr. Bezos uh, saw those lines that your guests have seen, you know, miles and miles of people waiting uh, to get food, parking lots like in San Antonio filled with 10,000 families waiting for food. And he, he contacted me, had, uh, had his team to contact me and talk through whether or not uh, we were the right place to invest such, such a significant investment. Mm. I tried to explain that in investing in our work, you're really investing in neighbors around the country. Apparently, he agreed, and that was important to him, and uh, the rest is, is history. Well, I want to get to the history of you, because you were in corporate America. You were a rock star, lawyer, the whole shoot and match. I want to get to that in a minute, but this, this Bezos thing is really interesting to me. When an organization like yours, Feeding America, which, by the way, for folks who don't know, it's a massive hunger relief organization with a network of, what, like 200 food banks, 60,000 meal pantries. What do you do? What is the beginning move with a $100 million donation? one of the things that we work hard to do is first, we, we need to know who we are mm -hmm. as an organization, what our priorities are, and then match that with donors who have an interest in investing in the work. And, and Mr. Bezos and his team were pretty clear about what their expectations were. They saw those lines out there and he wanted to help and he wanted to help urgently. So we brought all of the team together. That means every single member food bank, members of, of the Feeding American National Office team, we got together and we, we worked our way through what an appropriate methodology would be for getting those funds dispensed. We also, even in advance of that, we have a, a group that uh, represents our members called, we call them the NAC, uh, Network Advisory Council. And we sat with them and came up with the criteria for making certain that the money would go to where it was needed the most. But Mr. Bezos, again, he was pretty clear. Um, he felt there was urgency. We said there was urgency. He said, well, let's get this money deployed quickly. And that's what we did. And we've never been able to dispense that kind of capital in, in such a short window of time. But I'm actually calling you from the road. I think I told you that, Liz. And I, mm. I've been visiting food banks in the Texas panhandle and in each of those food banks they proudly show me what the result of Mr. Bezos gifts is so they show me for instance some of our food banks in rural America uh, especially and that's where I was I was mainly in rural food banks uh, on this particular trip I have been and in each of those places they talk about how uh, it feels like a paradox but that people who live in the heartland 
Uh, there's so much rural hunger out there. So they had a lot of difficulty with putting food on the shelves and then getting that food to people in need as a result of Mr. Bezos' gift. It came right when I think we had a lot of members who were starting to lose hope because we had this onslaught, um, 70% increase in demand at the beginning. And now we still average about 60% increase in demand. And they desperately wanted to help people and simply didn't have enough food to get it done. So we got that, we got the, the gifts out there and they put those gifts in action. And I, as of every food bank that I've gone to over the course of the last seven days, they were able to point to, to where those investments went, and it, they primarily went to food. Okay, I want I want all of our listeners to applaud in their own homes and or wherever they are in the car <laughs> listening. Thank you, Mr. Bezos. Claire, before yes. the pandemic, how many people were you serving? What were your numbers about nationwide? So we were serving about forty million people a year, and that's one of the 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 big challenges. Uh, I think, Liz, is that. When we think about ourselves as a country, we, this is an incredible country. Um, I happen to be biased and think it's the greatest country in the world. And, and it's, it's hard for us to imagine that in this country that there would be 40 million people before the pandemic who would have to turn to the charitable food system to feed themselves and their kids. But that was, in fact, true. And now, as a result of the pandemic, our estimates are we've done some uh, some work with uh, with McKinsey recently, and our estimates are that that number is going to grow to as much as 54 million people, mm. and that almost 20 million are going to be kids, Liz. Can you tell us today what the breakdown is of folks you served in previous years versus new people who before now had never been to a food bank? Absolutely. There, our numbers are... Um, about 40% of the people who were coming uh, in search of, of food with us today have never, never, ever imagined, uh, let alone use the charitable food system for food. So about 40%. I mean, hmm. it's huge. You mentioned kids. 22 million kids pre-pandemic were receiving free and reduced price lunches and were heavily reliant on those school programs. Then schools shut. You know, yeah. that was part of the huge problem. What do you expect to see come the fall when only some school districts are reopening? Yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons I, I'm so thrilled that you would have me on your show so that I can help to raise awareness about the urgency of that need for those, um, for those kids. So you're right, so 22 million kids before the pandemic. And then that doesn't account for the many, many millions of kids who were right on the precipice even before the pandemic. We don't have an accurate count of how many kids would need to access free or reduced lunch now that the pandemic's happened. And um, there's been a noble effort out there to try to help. There was some legislation that got passed in a bipartisan way. It's referred to as pandemic EBT. And what it basically did was it allowed those families who had kids who qualified for free and reduced lunch, it allowed them uh, money on an EBT card uh. that was uh, the same amount as the relative cost for those meals for each of those kids if they were in school so that they could go to a grocer and buy the food for their kids themselves. Good. Unfortunately, that's about to expire. So if that expires and we can't get kids back to school safely, then uh, it, it becomes really, really challenging very quickly. When does it expire? September. Oh, Claire, you actually know what a hungry child looks like. Our listeners may not know this, but your parents opened their home through the years to 107 foster kids, many of them malnourished and abused. I mean, to grow up with 107 siblings is, is quite unusual. Tell us about that. Yeah, and I actually, um, I don't ever actually identify how many of us are through foster care, how many of us are adopted, mm -hmm. and how many of us are through biology. And that, that gives you a flavor for how we were brought up, or as we would say in South Central Louisiana, how I was raised. <laughs> so, um, 
<laughs> so in many ways, it would be similar to other people's experiences growing up with siblings, you know. So just imagine that and then put a multiplier on it. So there were usually about 16 of us at home at any moment in time. Um, and and as you, you described, um, I've never known anything but that. That's the family that I came into from the beginning. <laughs> what was your parents' philosophy of taking dozens and dozens and eventually more than 100 foster children into their home? Well, first off, there was never such a plan. So we've, we've lost my mom. Uh, at this point, but I, I asked her questions about what what made you decide to do this, and she tells me she told me about um, the first uh, first two children who came into our home, and it was before I was born, and she learned about two kids in a neighboring town who were suffering from neglect and abuse, and. Uh, from the way I understood the story, my dad wasn't even home. He was away at work. And my mom being who she was, she got in the car and she went, she picked the kids up and she brought them home. Mm. And that's the way it started. And I, she could never turn her back on a child in need. She just didn't. She couldn't. So as she would learn about more children who, who had needs, um, people came to understand, well, Miss Mary Alice, she's that kind of person. So I have siblings who were adopted where we've had a teen mom who just, um, you know, kept her baby and then thought about it and realized that she didn't have the wherewithal uh, to actually um, uh, support the child and called my mom up and said, um, would you help? And my mom and the baby came straight from the hospital uh, mm. to our house. Uh, so it, it's been it's been my experience, as I said, my whole life. It started before I was even born. So um, for me, it's the only thing I know, and therefore it is normal. But when I talk to people, I, I could realize, Liz, I, I, at, for the longest time, I wouldn't even talk about how many siblings I had. And then it dawned upon me that it wasn't possible for people to understand who I was, <laughs> what I aspired to do with my life uh, without knowing that little detail. Oh, it's a beautiful detail that's much bigger than a detail. With these children came the realization, I'm sure for you at a very young age, that some children are not valued. They are abused, hungry. Yes. And to that yes. point, for what you're doing today with the food bank efforts, there's a culture of embarrassment when kids are ashamed that their families don't have enough money for food. Can you describe, Claire, how maybe some of your foster siblings who faced food insecurity or malnourishment behaved so that listeners can keep an eye out and maybe spot children dealing with the same situation and try to help them? Uh, it, you Thanks for that question, too. There is so much shame and embarrassment associated with poverty um, and and it's particularly challenging for children so as an example I've had uh, brothers sisters join our family and you notice that they haven't eaten for a while but they're uh, you you ask if they're hungry and sometimes they won't even say yes so when you you and there are lots of, of people facing hunger who are the neighbor next door. Yes. So it does require quite a bit of intentionality around being aware. When was the last time I witnessed that child eat? And how do I bring the child in with my family as the family's eating? We're going to get something. Can I get something for you as well? Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that I would encourage from your audience is that um, they practice that civility and kindness and, and treat people uh, with that, that respect and do it in a way where their kids are witnessing them do it that way. Because a big issue for kids is lunch shaming at school. Yes. So kids who have to get in that separate line because they are, they are on free or reduced lunch versus the other kids who don't have to get in that line. Our kids who can't, um, some, some schools will have special meals for kids who are on reduced lunch, but they haven't been able to pay 
are who are not even on reduced lunch in some cases, and they weren't able to pay. So then they get these special sandwiches or, you know, they've got something um, that they try to use to supplement. So it is an issue, and it's something that we're very uh, focused on trying to help mm-hmm. with. I think it starts with these with parents speaking out loud about their values, speaking out loud about their expectations for themselves and for their kids. And then I think inside of the schools, there are things that we can do that take the stigma out of it. Not having two lines might be one of those things. I like that. Um, No more two lines. Oh, there you go. You, my dear, are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Your grandparents were sharecroppers. Uh Neither of your parents graduated high school, and yet you became what you are today. But how did you go from a Walmart executive, a lawyer, big wig in the private (laughs) sector? I mean, this is an American dream story. It is. It truly is. And it's, um, it's one of the things that's so affirming for me, and I'll answer your question directly, but one of the things that's so affirming for me in the work that I do is there are people who were shocked, for instance, about the Bezos gift, or shocked about the outpouring of support that we received from, from the American public. And I'm not shocked. I'm pleased, but I'm not shocked because my whole life is a life uh, that shows um, the generosity and kindness and investment that you can get in this remarkable country of ours. So I certainly had wasn't coming from a position of wealth or power, um, but I had access to education and I took my studies seriously and was able to matriculate through high school and, 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 um, and undergrad and then law school. And I sometimes tell people about, I have an LLM in tax and my mom is, is known to have asked one of my siblings, so tell me what was wrong with that first law degree? She thinks it was bizarre that I would go to law school two times. Um, but so with all of that, the whole time I knew I wanted to be a lawyer from when I was a kid. I wanted to be a child advocacy lawyer, which would make a whole lot of sense considering my background. Um, but I've always had this facility for math. And I say I have a head for math and a heart for people. So I went to where that math uh, acumen took me. And it took me to these unique places that I never imagined I'd get to do. So I went along. I became a lawyer. I I worked in government, became a gubernatorial appointee, worked in a law firm, worked in big four accounting. Walmart was my client at uh, in the in the firm as well as at when I was at uh, PwC. um, And they asked me to come in house. Wow. I thought I was only going to be there for two years. That was the plan. I'm going to get in and get out. Uh, and and 13 years later, I was still at Walmart. Uh, yeah, life um, is funny that way. But, I mean, I thought I was only going to be at Fox for five years, and, and I'm looking at 13 coming <laughs> up. But so why give the money and the trappings that come with big careers like that, all that education, all that success in the private sector, why give that up to feeding America? I mean, what, what was the soul searching right. that you did? Or was it just simply, hey, this is a great opportunity. It fits with my childhood, my background. I want to do this. Explain that bridge. Yeah. Okay. In 2015, I'm moving right along. I'm executive vice president of finance and treasurer at Walmart, uh, breathing rarefied air. I have this bright idea, Liz, I'm going to go to the doctor and make sure I do my physical. I kept missing my physicals. So I said, mm. I'm going to stop. I'm going to have my executive physicals will always be on my birthday weekend so that I'll remember them. Right? Oh. So mm. I go to one, to one of my executive physicals. I didn't think about the fact that I might get bad news. And I did. 2015, I learned that I had cancer. Mm. And um, this whole time, I had been going along thinking, I've got plenty of time. Uh, you know, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, there's no need to rush to go and, and work on the front line of, of issues like, like hunger. Um, I, maybe I do that as the next phase of my career after I retire um, from Walmart. But that cancer diagnosis, the good news for me, by the way, is I'm a five-year cancer survivor. My oncologist told, told me there's no current trace of any cancer, and I've always had a really positive prognosis. But 
um, but something changed inside of me and I, I couldn't go back to, to uh, that, uh, that ignorant bliss, if you will, of, yeah. of this notion that I had a bunch of time. So uh, knowing that I started leaving uh, from that, as not long after I learned both that of the diagnosis and of the prognosis, um, I had a good conversation with my husband about the fact that I felt that I was supposed to be someplace else. Mm. And I started the process of, of finding my path to, to where I am now with Feeding America. And, and you talked about giving it all up, by the way. I just want to talk about that. And I know what you mean when you say it, but I didn't give any of it up. Every day I use... Um, the, those experiences and I bring them to bear in the work that I do now, those relationships. And I had actually, when I first started, I used to apologize for how long it took me to get into the role I'm in. And then I, I stopped apologizing because says, wait a minute. Um, those experiences are helpful to oh, the yes. work that I'm doing now. And, and I, I'm imperfectly doing all of the work, but man, I cannot imagine uh, trying to do this without, some of the experiences that I've had and, and most especially the people that I've met along the way um, and that those people, so many of them help us in this work today. And I wouldn't even have known them had I not been on this particular journey. So I don't begrudge myself anymore how long it took, uh, but, but man, I'm happy that I'm here <laughs> and doing what I'm doing. Well, that leads me to this as we, as we finish up. America, and you've learned this now, I mean, America prides itself in being one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. I mean, when people think of hunger, they're thinking of other countries, not the hunger in their own backyards. What are we That's doing it. wrong here? You know, I, I, this is what I'd say. This is an all-in fight. And I think what it requires first similar to me with the cancer story that I mentioned before, we needed a wake up call as a country. Um, there were some of these things, 40 million people facing hunger were hidden in plain sight. But when you, when, when we were all uh, self quarantining and we, and we saw those images of all of those cars and those long, long, long lines of people, I think that that has caused uh, as, has stirred us and yes. has increased our awareness. Now that we have that awareness, I believe we're going to do the things that are going to be necessary in order to, to change this narrative. So, and I think the kinds of things that we're going to need to do is to acknowledge within ourselves that it doesn't have to be this way. A country that throws away 72 billion pounds of perfectly edible food, not counting household waste every year, is not a country that should also have people who don't have enough to eat. Um, we grow enough food in this country to feed every single person in this country. So we have issues around matching food with the people who need them the most. We need to incentivize companies. Some companies actually do better to throw their food away than to give it away. <sighs> We've got to go in and look at some of these counterintuitive systems that we have in place. And um, I've had one of the things that I, I've, I've been thinking about quite a bit is that rather than think of this as an opportunity to go back to the way it was, I want to think of this as an opportunity to tear up the old playbook because it wasn't working for 40 million people and let's, we're going to write a new one. And, oh. and I'm energized by how many people who are, have joined this fight with us. Uh, of course, we talked about Mr. Bezos, but I also want to underscore Liz before, before we're done. I value every investment that's made in our work. Oh, that means course. people using their, using their voices, telling their members of Congress, get back to the table on things that are going to help people. I care about hunger. You should too. Um, if, you're, if you own a business, raising your hand and saying, I've got this special acumen inside of my business, I'll bet I could use it to help people facing hunger. I'm going to contact feedingamerica.org and find a way to do that. Um, so I think there, and then of course, donate, monetary donations and donations of food are important as well. And in the monetary donations, going back to that point, I get to actually open up envelopes with coins in them from little kids 
who broke into their piggy bank mm. to give money so that other kids get to go to sleep with full bellies. Um, it is so affirming to me. And I want to make sure in our work, the way that we invest in, in people facing hunger and in this issue um, is a testament to our respect for those people who are investing in us and in our work. So we will honor every single donation from coins to $100 million. Or if there's someone in the listening audience who feels challenged by that $100 million and wants to give more, feel free. We're a great place. Come in with $200 million. <laughs> We could use it. We could yeah. use it. But you'll take the change found under the couch cushions. Oh, Claire, what a wonderful story. Is that enough for you guys to understand how serious this problem is in our own backyards? But here is a woman, two law degrees, big executive, who turned around and said, I'm going to be part of the solution, not the problem. So I just find this incredibly inspirational. That is sort of the bar that we have to have for this podcast. I'm so glad that you took the time to listen. And please take the time Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, to watch the claim and countdown on the Fox Business Network. Stock market has been very interesting lately, but so have all the guests that we have on who tell great stories of success and, of course, how they got there. Thanks so much and have a great week. See you soon. For more podcasts like this, go to foxnewspodcasts.com.